Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at uh, this here RX Vega 64 that I've made some modifications to. So the first thing is I have it on a Frontier Edition shroud because I have a bunch of Vega shrouds lying around and one of those. So, you know, when I was choosing what heatsink to put on this, because I got sent this as a bare PCB, uh, I decided to go with the Frontier Edition shroud because why not? Um... But anyway, so yeah, that's that's why it looks like a Frontier Edition. It is not a Frontier Edition. It's a regular Vega 60. Actually, it's not even a regular Vega 64. This thing has some like, uh, like I tried a regular air cool cooled BIOS on it, and the drivers would just not tolerate that whatsoever. It has some weird like Vega 64 chip that takes a 200 and a 220 watt BIOS, which is super weird because a regular vega 64 has like a, a 260 a 264 watt bios yeah this this doesn't take 264 watt bioses um also apparently on the new amd drivers if you try to use like a bios uh well basically on the newest amd drivers if you use a bios from a card that you don't actually like from a different card it doesn't work properly on vega so i tried to use like a liquid edition bios that also didn't work very well at all. Uh, in the end, uh, the only way to get any extra power power into this is to make a soft power play table, uh, which you have to rip from the BIOS that you're actually using on the card. You can't rip the power play table off of like a Liquid Edition or a uh, or a different Vega 64 uh, to use it with with like this card. But as far as I'm aware, that's now now applies to all of the Vega cards. AMD apparently implemented a bunch of like uh safety checks into the driver so that you don't like take the wrong like don't shove it, different power play tables onto different cards which is really stupid but um yeah it is what it is um not really a huge issue because you can use the elmore evc2 for voltage control and then uh you can still just disable the power limits from the soft power play tables right like using the soft power play tables for voltage control in my experience has been incredibly janky and unreliable and so it's just kind of like well i wasn't going to really take advantage of that anyway um yeah so uh that's sort of the basic card here um, other than that, to try improve the cooling a bit, because it is on a blower heat sink, I've uh, removed, like, cut off, well, it's not really cut off, like, that's bent off. <laughs> you can tell by how, how, like, messed up the metal is. Yeah, I literally just, uh, and I don't think this is, uh, no, this, the, I'm not sure what PCIe bracket this is, it might be off of a completely different card, because AMD uses the same attachment, uh, for the base plate for basically all of their reference cards that use a blower heat sink. So you can find a lot of different PCIe brackets that you can just bend, like bend the unnecessary part off so that you get the, the hold down so that if you were installing this in a case, you can still, you know, bolt the card into the case, but uh, you open up the airflow a little bit more, assuming that the, the case doesn't have like a bar going down the middle of it. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure how effective this is, uh, mostly because I've basically not run the card at stock settings. I've only run it with like unlimited power limit and with no power limit, even if you don't overclock it, it pulls well over 300 watts. So the blower heatsink just doesn't have a chance, um, which blowers suck. I mean, it's, it's true. Like people keep trying to defend this. Like, like the whole problem is like, so you're, you're trying to get a significant amount of air through an opening this big. And on a regular card, it would also have like a bunch of air, like even further airflow restrictions. So yeah, I guess I could swap out the bracket for like a stock bracket, see if, see how much worse that is. Um, but honestly, at this point, I'm not bothered. Um, like I'm, I'm fine just running it like this. I don't really care about the, the comparisons. Anyway, uh, the more interesting thing that I've done with this card is uh, this card does actually use two point uh, m uh, two point uh, m two point five uh, screws for attaching the back plate and the front plate and like everything except the actual heatsink. Like this heatsink bracket that is threaded in M two, uh, but the rest of the screws on this are in M two point five. Um, oh, and the the fan is M two as well. But like everything else, like the the aluminum base plate that sort of gives the structure of the the blower heat sink that that is threaded in m2.5 and i've bought a bunch of m2.5 standoffs that i wanted to use on my 6900 xt only to find out that uses m2s for for like the back plate and everything so yeah anyway as a proof of concept so basically what i wanted to do with by like with these standoffs on this card is test the idea of using this to like get clearance for really oversized capacitors um 
and other modifications as well. It's just like there's a lot of modifications that if you're putting them onto a card, they end up, you know, significantly above the stock clearance of, of the, the, like, uh, significant, like, they, they end up sitting kind of tall off of the PCB. And you don't really want the card, like, lay, like putting all of its weight onto capacitors or something. Or if you put something on top of the card, you don't want that putting weight on the modifications. So, uh, yeah, the idea was to, like, so th this is sort of a, a test run of the whole, like, using the standoffs to, to basically have the backplate as a protective cover for modifications uh, on the card. And it works great. It works um, really, really well. If we take it off here... I mean, you can see the oscilloscope hookup sticking out over there, and I'll probably remove that if... Eh, actually, I don't know. I might replace that with, like, voltage meter hookups or something. Because um, at this point, like, the, the oscilloscope is great for checking how the... Uh, like, how the voltage... How good the voltage regulation is, but once you have that sorted out, it's just like you don't really need an oscilloscope for checking the, the op running voltage of the card. It's, it's a bit bulky and annoying. So anyway, uh, here's the actual modification. So the backplate only really helps with uh, clearance for this and the I square C header over here. Um, so yeah, and these capacitors, like I like, we'll look at the oscilloscope uh, shots of what, what those did. But uh, the these, like, I didn't add these expecting like massive voltage regulation improvements. I added these because I was like, well, I want a justification for s using those standoffs. So that's why I added those because these are. These are the these are 6.3 millimeter diameter capacitors, and that's basically why I why I even came up with the idea of using standoffs to get more clearance below the backplate is because I'm using 6.3 millimeter diameter capacitors on my 6900 XT, and uh, yeah, like this works. This works great. Um, in fact, this backplate has even less space under it than the backplate that the 6900 XT comes with. So these standoffs, like the clearance here is actually tighter than on the uh, 6900 XT, but it still works out just fine. So yeah, this whole idea of using standoffs to protect modifications on the back of the card, assuming that the card comes with a backplate, works great. Um, and this is probably going to be a thing that I'm going to be doing on a lot more of my cards because, yeah, there's there's a lot of cards that I have with um, either M2 or M2.5 threaded backplates and there's no reason not to do this as far as I'm concerned because, yeah, like, uh, it works. Um, and it, it's really, sim like, it's a super simple modification. Like, it's not real. Like, I don't even really consider it much of a modification. It's just kind of like you just add some standoffs, bam, done, you know, uh, really not much to it. So anyway, um, the sort of most useful modifications that I've done to this card are obviously the I2C hookup, which means that if you have the Elmore EVC2 or uh, potentially a Infineon USB 005, you can use that for getting voltage control on the card. Um, so yeah, which uh, I mean, on the stock air cooler, it's basically useless because the air cooler just sucks. Um, but if you had, like, a lot of cooling, like, water cooling, or maybe chilled water cooling, or straight up, like, the more sub-ambient you go, the more voltage you can run. So, uh, yeah, and I have actually run Vegas on liquid nitrogen in the past, but I never had proper voltage control on them. Because just getting voltage control on these things was, was just, it's a nightmare. Um, so this card is the first Vega that I have where I do have proper voltage control. So I'm very excited to take this thing sub-zero eventually. Um, hopefully I'll be doing that relatively soon. Um, because, yeah, I really want to know what, like, what's possible if you shove, like, I, like, on, on, the thing is, these cards don't get that cold. You can't run them below, like, minus 70. But if I can get this to well, minus 70, it's like, it might scale to 1.4 volts, um, which should be enough to run, like, well over 2 gigahertz core clock, consider, like, sustained in benchmarks on this. So, yeah, that's, that, that'll be interesting. Um, and anyway, so, yeah, the, the, that's the, the, the I square C header. Uh, then we have the oscilloscope hookup over here, uh, which is just on some V-core multilayer ceramic capacitors. Then we have the big polymers. These are 1200 microfarads, uh, yeah, 1200 microfarad uh, uh, RS8 series Nichicon uh, FP caps. Um, the RS8 series is like low ESL, fo like lower ESL optimized, like optimized for low ESL. Um, you, you trade that off with slightly higher ESR, like you can get 5 milliohm ESR FP caps. These are seven. 
Um, I don't really think it makes that much of a difference. Um, in my experience, the problem with through-hole capacitors is generally the ESL. Like, I've used 5 milliohm ESR uh, polymers, and they just lose to your SMD polymers. Uh, like, through-hole polymers just lose to SMD polymers uh, because primarily the ESL. These have much less ESL than these do, um, regardless of, of how you attach them. It's just like the, this style of packaging just works better. So... Yeah, so I added these, and these these are really there. Like, so I didn't add these expecting like massive voltage regulation improvements. It was more like, uh, you know, just just to prove that the backplate clearance works out well. And the other modification I've done is all of uh, I've added this cap, that cap, that cap, this one, this one, this one, this one, and these two down here. Maybe also this one. Wait, one, two. I added ten of them, so I'll have to count them. Or we could just look at the soldering quality. <laughs> that tends to be a pretty good giveaway with... Uh, okay, so it'll be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, so I also added this one. So I added 10 of these uh, 470 microfarad uh, aluminum polymer capacitors from Panasonic. These are SP caps. I don't know what the exact spec on them is because these are capacitors that I've pulled out of my recycled capacitors box. This is not recommended, okay? Panasonic, in their documentation for these, very explicitly states that you should not reuse them uh, after soldering them, like after desoldering them. However, um, this card is a bit dodgy, and I didn't really feel like putting fresh new, like fr fresh expensive capacitors onto it. So yeah, I've just kind of gone like, ah, eh, screw it. We'll, we'll use uh, questionable origin capacitors. Um, and they work fine. In fact, they they are the biggest improvement to voltage regulation on this card is from those uh, used polymers that I that I threw on there. Um, and yeah, there's there's ten of them. So I guess uh, and, and let, let's just take a look at the oscilloscope shots at this point, right? Like that's that's the interesting part. So that's the modifications. Just you know, I square C header, some extra capacitors. Oh, I guess I should have also mentioned that I did add a bunch of multi-layer ceramics. These didn't do anything. The thing is, so these are 22 microfarad 0603s. Um, and the problem with, with adding a bunch of these is that the capacitor, like just look at how many multi-layer ceramic capacitors a Vega reg like just comes with from the factory. And those things are 47 microfarads. Almost all of them are 47 microfarads in my, in my experience. Like I've actually, like, I have Vegas, like, uh, the, the some of the dead Vegas that I have, like, I've basically been pulling these capacitors off of them because they're 47 microfarad multi-layer ceramics. Those are relatively expensive. Also, you shouldn't be, again, you shouldn't be doing that, but I've not yet had a capacitor blow up on me uh, from, like, being recycled. I have, like, I've not recycled tantalums yet because every time I've tried to desolder tantalums, they end up smelling really bad. Um... So I guess I've burnt those, but these I've not run into those kinds of issues. And multi-layer ceramics also, I've just not had any bad experiences with those. Um, even though if you, you read like the documentation, it's like you really shouldn't be doing that. But anyway, um, yeah, um, the thing is, yeah, so the, the existing multi-layer ceramics are 0805 47 microfarad capacitors. And there is ton, like there is so many of them. So in order to make a significant difference in terms of the voltage regulation, you would probably need to add like a 22 microfarad multi-layer ceramic per existing 47 microfarad multi-layer ceramic. And like, I'm not doing that. Like what I'm basically like, you can see that I filled out a lot of them, but I didn't fill out every single one, right? Like what, what I'm thinking is, like, if I wanted to actually get a noticeable improvement, I'd probably have to add a cap here, 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 uh, all of the ones along the top at, like, th this row, like, I'd have to probably fill out that row. Um, yeah, like, I'd have to add a lot more caps than what I added, and it's just, like, I can't be bothered. Um, yeah, so... Also, I don't think there's much room for improvement left. Once, like, once we look at the oscilloscope shots, like... This configuration on the card is running, like, just over 100 millivolts peak to peak, which I can't think of a single card in my collection that is, like, significantly, especially at this kind of power draw, there's, like, no other cards in my collection that run that low peak to peak voltages. So, as far as I'm concerned, it's like, this is it. Like, it's not gonna get better because, like, from the factory, this thing is already really, really good. 
and then you know you add the 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 S like you add a like you add the ten four hundred seventy microfarad SP caps, and it basically flatlines um, by GPU uh, standards um, in my experience. Because yeah, like most cards are somewhere between like a hundred eighty millivolts peak to peak and three hundred millivolts peak to peak. This um, in its stock configuration is you know in that one eighty millivolt range. And then once you modify it, it's down to 120. If we think about other cards that I have that are in the 120 range, there's the GTX 770 Lightning, which has an insane number of capacitors on it. Uh, there's the 770 Classified I have, which is also a similar situation, just absolutely ridiculous output filter on that as well. Um, and so, yeah, I think this this is flatlined. Um, like, it's not getting better because it was, like, it, it's just not, like, at this point... There's, I, I don't think there's much I can do. Maybe, maybe messing with like the super small ones. Like you can see that there's like 0402s scattered in between the 0805s or are those even 0402s? Those might be 0201s. I'm not sure, but there's like the really little ceramics, right? Scattered in between the 0805s. So maybe if you at, like started stacking those, it might give you a bigger improvement. But again, like those are even lower capacitance. So you'd probably need a lot of them. Uh, before it started making a noticeable difference, which is just like, yeah, that's that's way too fiddly. I am not doing that. Um, anyway, let's take a look at those oscilloscope shots. So here we have graphics test one from 3D Mark Firestrike. This is at stock voltage, uh, but blow, no power limit, right? Stock voltage, but no power limit. So the card is running constant core voltage the entire time for the test. I believe I was running 1100 megahertz HBM clock, but stock core clocks. So um, because I didn't really want to worry about, like, the co core, uh, crashing on me during testing, and I didn't really feel like stability testing it too much. Also, the thing is with Vega, there's not a lot of core clock headroom once you remove the power limit. Like, you're not going to significantly increase the core clock. Uh, not on this card anyway. Like, maybe I could have tested, like, th this was running... I could, well, maybe I could have run it at, like, 50 megahertz more, which, considering the stock clock speeds, just, it's not going to make much of a difference. Um... Anyway, so, you know, we have the first, uh, I'm gonna have to move the mic here. This is super awkward right now. Um, okay, there we go. Um, so, here we have the stock configuration, and you can see the, actually, the VPP, I lied, the VPP is even better. Like, peak to, average peak to peak for the entire, like, for one pass of graphics test one is 165 millivolts. The maximum peak to peak, so that's the worst case scenario during the entire test, is 190 millivolts. Um, you know, and if we, zo like, in terms of uh, RMS voltage, we're running around 1.17 volts. Maximum voltage, we, we have, like, uh, what is that, like, 80, like, 50 millivolts of overshoot. Because the actual, like, voltage that's being requested from the voltage controller is 1.2 volts. And then it dips down due to V-droop. So as long as we're below one point, like, it's not overshoot until you go over the requested voltage. Right, like if you're requesting 1.2 volts, then you have your V-droop, which is fine. Uh, and uh, well, like undershoot is the voltage goes below the V-droop level, uh, b below the requested V-droop. And overshoot is the voltage goes above the requested voltage, just without, like, just yeah, goes above requested voltage. So 1.25 volts, not that's not really a lot of overshoot right there. Uh, the undershoot is I actually don't know how bad it is. Right, because obviously the RMS voltage doesn't perfectly account for the V droop throughout the entire workload. Because the the thing is, the current draw of the card goes up and down based on which part of the frame render cycle is uh, you're in, which is why you get that really no like the why the voltage is so noisy. Um, so some of that is just going to be like the actual the droop. Uh, some of that is going to be actual undershoot. Um, and anyway, um, which is also why, like, even if you keep adding capacitors, you're still going to have a spread of voltages. Even, like, even if you had, like, zero undershoot and zero overshoot, as long as there's a load line, there's still going to be a spread of voltages. You'd have to run no, like, if you wanted, like, a perfectly flat line with, like, 10, 20 millivolts of peak to peak, you would have to have no load line and no overshoot and no undershoot all at the same time and this is just like that's not happening so there's there's a limit to how you know how low the peak to peak can be um and a hundred like 165 millivolts on average like for, out of the from the factory is really good in my experience like the, there's a lot of cards that will come from the factory with like 200 millivolts or more um 
So anyway, um, yeah, so the gap between the average RMS voltage, which, you know, is 1.17 volts, uh, we go down to worst case scenario minimum is 1.08 volts. Um, so that's a gap of like 90 millivolts, which is not, not too bad uh, in my experience. So that's the stock configuration of the card. Then here we have uh, just adding the SP caps. So the 470 microfarad uh, Panasonic, uh, like, yeah, Panasonic SP caps. Um, so that's the SMD polymers. And you can see we absolutely like all of the over, like the overshoot just gets deleted. <laughs> it's just gone, right? Um, also, the average voltage reading is down, which the, the, might be a probe hookup thing. The thing is also just if you, well, the, by removing the overshoot, it can potentially lower the RMS voltage reading just like that. That That is a thing that I've had happen multiple times on GPUs in the past. But yeah, like all of that over there, it like it's gone. Like previously you'd, you'd had a lot of like random upward spikes. They're, they're just not there anymore. So um, yeah, which is, which like removing overshoot is easy. You just throw more capacitance at the problem and the overshoot goes away. It really is that simple. Um, undershoot is a different matter, um, but we still see a very, very negligible improvement there. You know, we're at 1.16 average and a minimum voltage of 1.08. So our RMS voltage went down, our minimum voltage didn't go down with it. So uh, there is now like a 80 millivolt gap between the average voltage and the worst case scenario minimum, which is a 10 millivolt improvement. Uh, basically irrelevant. Like that would probably translate to maybe the ability to run like 10 megahertz more core clock, maybe. Um, so yeah, that's, that's like, oh, well, uh, yeah, so that's really not much of an improvement, um, but it's something. Also, peak-to-peak, -peak, uh, you know, on average is down to 123 millivolts peak-to-peak. -peak. Worst case scenario is down to 140 millivolts. So there's like a 50 millivolt improvement in the peak-to-peak -peak values. But the thing is, peak-to-peak -peak doesn't really translate into overclocking improvements. Like, the thing is, you can, a big peak-to-peak -peak improvement can a lot of the time be achieved by just crushing the, mac like, the overshoot, which is, like, overshoot doesn't cause blue crashes. Like, it doesn't cause blue screens, it doesn't cause the card to crash, it's just kind of ugly to look at. Um, potentially, if you're running a lot of voltage, it can cause, like, damage to the silicon over time, but at stock voltages, like the overshoot, or at low voltages like this, or even the kinds of voltages that I'd be willing to run on the card, the overshoot isn't a concern. Like, it really isn't. So so this is kind of like, well, that, that's neat that we've got this huge peak-to-peak -peak improvement, but um, uh, totally irrelevant. Um, not actually significant to the overclocking capabilities of the card whatsoever. Um, anyway, then we have the, the extra 1200 microfarad polymers. Right, so that's the, the three capacitors. And the thing is, like, I added three of them, right? So not only are those big polymers uh, higher ESL, higher ESR than the SP, and higher ESR than the SP caps, I added 4,700 microfarads worth of SP caps, right? I only added 3,600 microfarads of those 1,200, like, of, of the FP caps, uh, of the through-hole polymers. Uh, so I really wasn't expecting them to do much of anything, uh, and, I mean, the oscilloscope agrees. <laughs> it really didn't do much of anything, right? So RMS voltage went down again a little bit. Uh, minimums didn't... Oh. Minimums didn't improve... Like, minimums didn't get worse, right? We're still at 1.08 minimum, so... I, I guess you could consider that a slight improvement in terms of undershoot. Peak-to-peak, -peak on average, is, like, 5 millivolts better, which is just, like, irrelevant as far as I'm concerned. Worst-case scenario, peak-to-peak -peak is also... Uh, like 10 millivolts better, right? Previously it was uh, 104, I mean 140 millivolts, now we're down to 130 millivolts. Uh, maximum overshoot is basic, like the thing is the RMS voltage went down, so overshoot seems to be about the same. Uh, so yeah, th this really didn't do much of anything, but I wasn't really expecting it to do much of anything. It was, like, I really did add those basically just to go, like, will the backplate clear them properly? And the answer to that is yes. Did they do anything electrically? No. Was I expecting them to do much electrically? No. Um, so I would consider that a success. <laughs> And then we get to the multi-layer ceramics. So this is the final configuration of the card. And um, talk about diminishing returns. So RMS voltage came back up again, which I have no idea why that is. Um, by, uh, yeah, so RMS voltage is back up. 
Um, the RMS to minimum gap is smaller than ever. It's at 70 millivolts. So, you know, we started out with 90 average voltage of 1.17 versus a minimum, worst case scenario, minimum of 1.08. Though average minimum was also 1.08. Well, now we're down to an average, like RMS voltage on average is 1.17. And uh, worst case scenario minimum is 1.110. I mean 1.10 and uh, best like average minimum is also 1.10 so uh, you know like at this point the minimums and the the RMS voltage are pretty close together but uh, again it's like it's not a huge improvement it is like th this this should start showing up in terms of slightly better overclocking but yeah not not really like basically you would start like you start getting like major noticeable overclocking improvements when you have like 50 plus millivolts you know well not 50 but like one like 30 40 millivolts you know 50 millivolt improvements that's sort of when i start getting excited um i really wasn't expecting much on a vega though because this card basically has, at least as far as AMD reference cards are concerned, this is basically the best VRM AMD has ever made in terms of both input filtering and output filtering. Technically, uh, 6900 XTs have like better power stages, but the filtering on 6900 XTs, in my opinion, is significantly worse. Um, and also in my test, like in, in, in terms of testing, it also seems to be significantly worse. So yeah, the, like the, these are basically like on, if you compare the ref, the reference Vega PCB to some like extreme overclocking cards, this is actually really similar to what you would get on like a 290X Lightning. Um, in terms of everything, actually, like pa like the MOSFETs used, the phase count, the filtering configuration, like these are basically extreme overclocking cards from the factory. Um, so expecting a much room for improvement was just like, yeah, no, uh, <laughs> there, there really wasn't much room for improvement. But um, yeah, it looks like maybe the card will will clock a little bit better in terms of cl core clock. The the thing is is just also on the air cooler, it's just I'm at the like I'm at the mercy of the operating temperature of the card primarily, uh, more so than the actual voltage regulation. So, yeah, I've not really been able to to note like me, like in terms of actual overclocking improvements, I've not really noticed anything. Um but maybe when I take the card sub-zero and start hitting it with significantly more voltage, it might start being somewhat significant. Either way, it doesn't hurt the card in any way, right? Like, well, it harms the reliability of the card. Like, arguably, the card is going to have a capacitor fail on it now in, like, sooner. I've not yet had that happen. Like, I've not yet had a capacitor blow up on a card that I've modified. Theoretically, it is a risk that that can occur. I've just not run into it yet. So either I'm getting, like, I, I might just be getting lucky or the risks of, uh, you know, soldering and desoldering capacitors like this are greatly overstated by the manufacturers. Anyway, um, yeah, with the 22 microfarads, also the peak to peak is now, look, three millivolt improvement on average. Yay, <laughs> worst case scenario is still the same. The oscilloscope, like, admittedly, maybe we would see bigger improvements if my oscilloscope had a bit more resolution, but I, like, you know, it would maybe be like a 35 millivolt improvement instead of a of a 30 millivolt improvement compared to stock. Or wait, no, it's 20, right? Yeah, because this is 70 millivolts, that's 90. Yeah, so maybe instead of looking at like a 20 millivolt improvement on average, like in, in minimums, we would see like a 30 millivolt improvement in minimums or a 25 millivolt improvement in minimums, which still isn't very significant. Um, yeah, so that's GT1. So that's graphics test one. And this the GT1 is like the most power hungry test in, in Firestrike. Um, and then we get to the GT2 tests. So this is GT2, um, very different noise pattern. This is right at the, like the, the thing is I save the oscilloscope screenshot at the end of the, uh, like at the end of the test, but the actual um, measurements are averaged over the, like the minimum, average, maximum, those are all taken over the whole duration of the test. So yeah, GT, uh, GT2, we kind of see bigger improvements, I guess, because, you know, RMS voltage on average was 1.17 volts. Worst case scenario, minimum was 1.07. 
Uh, which is kind of surprising, because GT2 doesn't pull as much power as GT1 does. You'd think GT1 would actually have worse transients because of just how much power it's pulling, but no. Minim worst case scenario minimum is, is in GT2. Peak-to-peak uh, -peak is very similar to GT1, right? Previously, we were looking at like 165 millivolts on average with a worst case scenario of 190. Uh, in GT2, we're looking at 163 millivolts with a worst case scenario of 180, so it's not really much of a difference there. Um... And uh, yeah, max max worst case scenario overshoot was 1.27 volts. Uh, on GT1, it was 1.28 volts. So yeah, not really much much to to look at there. Um, anyway, um, next we have the first modifications again. So this is just the SP caps. Um, and with the SP caps, you can see, again, we've just crushed the overshoot. It's gone. Actually, here we see a bigger improvement than in GT1. Um, we go from 163 millivolts down to... Wait, was it bigger? Oh, yeah, it's... Well, not really. No, it's about the same, right? That was 123 versus 165, and now we're getting 163 versus 121. So, yeah, similar improvement in terms of average peak-to-peak, -peak, maximum peak-to-peak -peak down to 140 millivolts. Pre also, like, yeah, basically, basically didn't, like, peak-to-peak -peak improvement is about the same. RMS voltage came down by 10 millivolts. Minim Worst-case scenario, minimum came up by 10 millivolts. Uh, so, actually, a nice improvement in, in RMS, like, minimums here, right? Because that's an 80 millivolt, uh, yeah, let's 80 millivolts worst-case scenario relative to the average. Um, here we're looking at like 100 millivolts. So this is a bigger improvement than what we were seeing in GT1, which is nice, I guess. Uh, still not very significant considering that it's only 20 millivolts, but it's something. And at higher power draw levels, it should be more, like, it should become more significant. Um, I'm, like, I can't test at higher power draw levels on the stock blower cooler, so <laughs> it's kind of limiting the testing here. Um... Oh yeah, so that's sort of what the SP caps did. And again, like, if you're going to be modifying a Vega with extra capacitors, just whack a bunch of SP caps on it and call it a day, in my opinion, because the further modifications that I did, yeah, really didn't do much. Um, so RMS voltage for when, when I added the FP caps, um, still the same, 1.16 on average, minimum, one point, like, worst case scenario, minimum, 1.08, average work minimum, 1.09. Uh, same as the, same as without the FP caps, right? Like, if without the FP caps, this is the same minimums. Uh, maximum is, uh, 1.21, like, average maximum is 1.21. Worst case scenario, maximum 1.22, uh, which is the same as the previous configuration. And, uh, VPP, the thing with the VPP measurement is it actually takes the peak-to-peak, -peak, uh, within the, uh, like, w within the data that's on screen, uh, on the oscilloscope. So, uh, technically, like, this is actually, like, a 140, like, if you, if you take the maximum measured voltage, like, worst case scenario maximum, right, which is, uh, 1.22, and you compare it to worst case scenario minimum, which is 1.08, you would actually get, like, 140 millivolts, uh, worst case scenario peak to peak, but the thing is that minimum condition wasn't achieved on this at the same time as the maximum condition, so it doesn't show up in the maximum peak to peak. But uh, yeah, if if I used a bigger uh, like if I had the oscilloscope at like ten milliseconds per division instead of five milliseconds per division, it would have probably fixed that. But um, I prefer having more like having the like noise being more visible. Like, you can see that it's, like, it's not just, like, the, the thing is, um, yeah, like, I prefer using the, the lower time, uh, the shorter time, uh, time, uh, shorter time per division. Um, so, anyway, so, yeah, basically, uh, the FP caps just didn't do anything. Um, then we get to adding the 22 microfarad multilar ceramics, and, uh, that didn't really do much of anything either. <laughs> Right. Um, so RMS voltage went up by. Uh, actually, no. It sort of improved the mil mi minimums because RMS voltage went up by 10 millivolts. So we're back up at 1.17 again. Uh, minimum voltage is up at one point. Like worst case scenario, minimum is 1.10 now. So there's only a 70 millivolt gap instead of the 100 millivolt gap. So GT2 actually saw a pretty big improvement in terms of minim minimums. Uh, overshoot is up because the RMS voltage came up, but the actual overshoot relative to the RMS voltage hasn't changed. 
um cuz you know RMS voltage went up by 10 millivolts overshoot went up by 10 millivolts so that's that that's really not a significant change there uh peak to peak is 3 millivolts better <laughs> So basically, uh, a very insignificant improvement right there. Um, the worst case scenario, peak to peak is actually improved um, technically because, like, that's worst case. Uh, worst case was one point two three here and one point one versus the one point two two and one point oh eight. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's kind of that for uh cap modding the vega 64 basically don't bother with anything other than the sp caps in my opinion um yeah i don't really think that doing anything else but the sp caps is is like worth it like honestly even the sp caps is debatable uh debatable in my opinion but uh at least with the sp caps like you have unpopulated capacitor pads for them like the vrm was designed to actually have those there so it's super easy to just add those on but everything else is just, like, you actually need to start getting, like, creative with where you put them, and it's just annoying. Um, and the the improvement, like, the benefits are hard, hard to measure. <laughs> right? So, yeah. Anyway, um, so, there, that is it for, so, yeah, that's it for this video. Um... Thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon. There's a link to that down in the description below. There's also the AHOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, stickers, posters, you know, the usual uh, YouTuber merch. Um, it would be much appreciated if you check out the, well, the Patreon and the Teespring store because it helps out immensely with running the channel. And, uh... Yeah, that's it for the video, so... Oh, this one's not going in. That's it for the video, so... Thanks for watching, and... Goodbye! <laughs>